morning, everyone. Uh, as introduced, my name is Aide Jorosimua. I'm an arts and culture journalist, um, but I'm probably the least interesting person on this panel. Um, quite <laughs> flattered to be speaking to both of you, and I'm just going to just like jump straight into it. Um, so the talking about representation today, uh, black women in in film, and I wanted to start by asking uh, what representation meant to both of you as a uh, Nigerian American in Hollywood and as a documentary filmmaker in Nigeria. Uh, Dick Burry can start. So you said what was, what did representation mean? What does representation mean to you, yeah. Um, I mean, it's everything. I think in the beginning of my career when I started, um, when I made the switch to acting from medicine, I struggled a bit with that choice because I didn't really see many people who looked like me doing the kind of work that, I, that intrigued me about acting. And so it was a bit of a you know, push and pull, um, but I'm thankful that the dreams, my, the voice of my dreams were louder than the voice of the doubt and the questioning. And I think we live in an amazing time now because what we're seeing in TV and film are so many different kinds of people, particularly Africans who live all over the diaspora. Um, so there really is, I'm, I'm thankful that there are, anyone else who is trying to get into this, they don't have to look too far and doubt whether they have a, there's a place for them because there are people um, you see with like Denai and Lupita, and I mean there's names go on and on and on and on, particularly with acting, but also in directing. There's so many um, black women from the diaspora who are directing and writing and um, cinematographers, uh, art direction, so it's really, 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 um, hi. it's a really, really exciting time. Um, yeah, and everyone should see themselves represented in all fields, particularly the creative fields, and particularly black women, so, and we're seeing that. Thank you. Um, for me, representation, I guess, would be seeing my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions represented in the arts. So with me being film and documentary, so I guess that that exactly being your being able to see yourself in the art. Uh, okay, for you, okay, good. Ask them what representation means to you as okay. an actress in Nollywood, for instance. As a what? As an actress in Nollywood, what does representation mean to you? Wow. Well, okay, first of all, good morning, everyone. Uh, apologies for my late arrival. Um, Representation matters really because women are very complex and I feel like there's always the expectation that women are either the witch, the whore, or the saint. You know, we, we have so much more going on inside of, of us and I think we need to see more of that in film because it represents us, it, represent, it shows that we matter. You know, it shows that our stories matter. And um, it's very important for everyone to feel that they can see themselves on screen, you know. And for me, coming into Nollywood at a time where women were always crying, you know, there was always like, oh, he hurt me. Oh, you know, Namdi left me, you know, um, and all of that stuff. So I came in at a time where um, women were asking questions and fighting back. Um, so everyone used to, they, uh, I was always kind of typecast as the bad girl. I had dreadlocks. So even the representation of having dreadlocks in Nigeria in the early 2000s was very powerful. Um, and in retrospect, you know, we now have a natural hair movement and all of this stuff. I'm not saying that I single-handedly did that. But I think it's important to see those things and see women you know, being strong and, you know, speaking truth to power. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to, to see Nollywood evolve in terms of the kind of women we're seeing on screen. I mean, we're seeing King of Boys. You're seeing a woman that's, a, you know, head of criminal gang. I'm not saying, it's not glorifying it, but it's just saying, look, this is real, you know. Um, Isoken, a, a woman who's standing up and saying, I don't have to be married. I don't have to take on that pressure. You know, I think it's very, very powerful, you know, for, for women and girls growing up to see those things, you know, so yeah. Let's stay on that a little bit. Um, so when I was just sort of thinking about this panel, 
And so I would say, for instance, or assume, correct me, that sort of representation, instead of like women seeing themselves on screen in Nigeria, is not the problem. It's the kind of the stories kind that have been of told. Stories, yes. And I wonder, because we also have, you know, the, um, I think the, the industry is sort of led by even female filmmakers, is, 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 is it a question of catering to what the audience wants to see? Is it that investors will not put money down for a story that's seemingly radical? Um, is it that the scriptwriters themselves are, you know, not tuned in? Like, what, 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 what is to just articulate the problem exactly? Why are we still saying these things? Well, I think it's, it's a bit of both and a lot more. Um, yeah, of course, people want to. Then we have a bandwagon effect in Hollywood sometimes. You know, like when there's a particular theme that's hot, everyone's now going there. If it's love film, everybody's doing love film. If it's comedy, everyone's doing comedy. You know, so you can get stuck with that cycle and fighting against that. You know, and bringing a story that's very anti what's hot is seen as a risk. And you know this business is about money, it's about numbers, people are putting their hard-earned money down, you want to make sure you're able to give them back their money, you know, and sleep well at night. Um, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a combination of that, and you know, maybe we get lazy sometimes, you know, we get stuck in that same cycle, but it's to swim against that tide and have those voices and the support, because um, women, representation in film also is an issue with financing, you know, and being at the helm of your project. You know, those things help, you know, and if you're not supported enough to do those things, it's harder to swim against that tide. Yeah. And I'll jump to you, I think we're in your specific context. Um, so, because you mentioned something like, what, so for you, seeing your, someone that looks like you on screen and the kind of story that you also want to tell as well. But, you know, we hear that, you know, um, Hollywood is, you know, is predominantly white, right? And, but I'm not always understood sort of what the, obviously I, I sort of understand what the problem is, but speaking from someone who has personal experience, is it that the scripts aren't being written about black people in general? Is it um, that you won't even get, ca you won't even get a casting call? Um, what are sort of the obstacles that sort of, yeah, that have allowed this to persist? Yeah, I think, there are those obstacles and so much more. It's a bit complex. I think what's great about now, and it's been happening for a while, is yes, there were scripts not being written from a range of perspectives. And so it's coming through a filtered version of, you know, dominant culture in America, which is white culture, which is connected kind of to white supremacy and all that stuff. And so depending on the view of, you know, dominant culture, that's kind of what they're trying to put out in, in films and in scripts. And so you read things in the past that were very limiting. You know, it was, you know, it was like in the past, people joked about you're either playing a crackhead or, you know, an urban mother or, you know, and depending on how you looked, that kind of puts you in certain boxes. And so, you know, if you had natural hair, that meant one thing. If you didn't have natural hair, that meant another thing. And so, when you're coming against those things, it's hard to be seen um, for a wider range of things just because people have automatically, just by looking at you, have put you in a box. And particularly as a black woman, uh, it's very, it, it had been a very limiting box, um, which can be very challenging and um, very frustrating. Um, but again, uh, now, I really don't think that's the case because, I mean, I'm, I'm an optimist and I've always have been. There's so many examples, so many examples of people who have just stuck true to building and creating um, the stories that are important to them. We're seeing it. I mean, people who are African Americans, Africans of the diaspora, people are able to tell their stories. And now we live in a world where people don't have to wait. Um, people are making their stories, and it's the adage of if you build it, they will come. People have been on the ground making their stories in their small collectives in LA, in New York, all over the country. And because they've been focusing on that, then people are coming in and saying, oh, what are you guys doing over there? And, you know, a lot of the films like Pariah, and I mean, I can name so many films, but these filmmakers were so focused and committed to their perspective, and they were relentless, and they didn't, they didn't try to conform themselves or you know, give them, give them what they thought they wanted to see, which can be a bit of a mind, you know, 
a mind fuck for, you know, excuse my language, but um, so that's kind of what I've been seeing and focusing on um, and we're seeing more and more of that. So a lot of the things, I mean, I choose not to focus on the challenges, even though the challenges have been very, very real um, because uh, all I see are the people who are, who are making a way in spite of and because of uh, the things that have been set by dominant culture, AKA Hollywood. Mm. And moving away from the, from the, ugh, moving away from the <laughs> challenges. Um, so Nadine, you for instance have sort of chosen, I watched some of your short films that were led by young women, y girls really. And why, and I was just talking to you about this earlier, um, where you said when we're um, discussing, even though you're, you have female protagonists in your story, uh, so you say you don't want to be boxed in, but being called a feminist storyteller. Um, and I want to understand, like, what, you know, sorry, your own, what is your interpretation? Like, what does that mean to you when you say that? Yes, you don't want to be boxed in as a feminist storyteller. Um, for me, I'm still so young, and I'm t trying to figure out the stories that I want to tell. But what I've realized is I'm telling stories that matter to me, whether it's my opinion or things I'm seeing in society. If it's, I use film as a way to speak up about what I see, but I don't, I'm not bold enough to stand with the mic and say. Mm -hmm. So for me, film is that kind of tool to tell my own opinions. Mm -hmm. And so far, it has been about female leads. So when I first got back to Nigeria and all I was hearing in the news was about Boko Haram, suicide bombings, but nobody was talking about who was doing the suicide bombings. It was just Boko Haram. Nobody was saying, oh wait, but is it children? Is it the girls? And I think about 70 or 80% of the suicide bombings were done by young children and they were by the girls. So for me, it was interesting to flip the story around and give it a different perspective. So is it that girl, the girls want to do it? Are they being forced to do it? And then what exactly is the thought process of somebody in that situation? Mm. So it was that kind of story that I wanted to tell, which is what, why it led to being a girl's perspective. Mm. With Tolu, um, with Tolu, Tolu was actually supposed to be my second short film. It was um, supposed to be a boy that goes on a fishing journey to prove himself to his family. Mm -hmm. And I, for some reason, I couldn't find a, an actor to portray this little boy. And I was talking to my little brother and he was like, well, does, why, why a boy, why not a girl? And it changed the whole dynamic of the story because I was thinking to myself, okay, I've written it as a boy, but then it would be a lot stronger if it was a girl, because why can't a girl, it's again with stereotypes, so why I thought of the story as a fisherman of a little boy, but then in the end I was thinking, okay, actually it could be a girl, why can't it be a girl? And then I explored that avenue. So it's not necessarily me choosing to tell the female story, but then it just happens to be based on like what I'm seeing and how I'm perceiving life, I guess. Mm, thanks for that. And um, I asked this to three of you can answer this. I wonder if this, even that question sort of comes from my own bias, where when a woman does something, it has to be making some kind of statements, as opposed to when a man does it, it's just like, oh, yeah, it's normal. So like, how do the three of you sort of like, I don't know, deal with that sort of expectation or burden? Like even me asking you this question, because like, somebody else might ask you, you know, like, are you like a feminist activist or whatever, just because you chose to tell this particular kind of story? Um, so I think how do you sort of deal with that burden or pressure or? No, it's not a, I, it's not a burden that I, I take on because I, I do the things that I want to do. And so that's good enough for me. I don't weigh myself down with any expectation. I kind of, I'm at this point of learn to trust in terms of the projects that I choose to, to do um, and also the projects that I choose to, the stories that I choose to tell as a, as a director and a writer. And so, yeah, I don't, I don't burden myself with any of that stuff. I, I, I trust my gut, and so I just go with that, and that's everything for me, yeah. And you, Takari, what do you, like, do you, is that something that you consider, like, being sort of tagged, so to speak, when you, like, as you were telling me, you're doing a project, you're working on a project right now where, yes. the, yeah, just tell us about that and what you think. Well, I think it's important to just state your opinion, you know? Take up space in the room and say, hey, this is the way I see the world, and we have the opportunity to do it now, you know, with technology, you can make short films, you can, you know, make a feature film, you can do whatever, a documentary, 
there's so many different ways of expressing yourself and especially as a woman, but not even not just as a woman, just as a human being, you know, we all have perspectives. So for me, with this project I'm working on, um, it's about, a, it's a female lead. This is how it's presented itself, you know. Um, I never set out to, to do that, but it's the spirit, you know, and it's also, you know, what you're feeling at that moment. And um, it just chronicles her story, you know, her, her rise, you know, like a phoenix from the ashes of the Wahala in Nigeria, you know, and the music industry is very male dominated, you know, we're, we're in a patriarchal society right now, you know, so this is what the story is about. And I think it's important to have um, themes that you're, you really care about. Um, I'm an advocate for um, SGBV, which is sexual and gender-based violence, for instance, so I get a chance to put that in, you know, and, you know, just talk about stuff that I feel is important. Um, I also have a mass communication background, so I'm kind of a journalist as well, so I get to flex that muscle, um, working on a documentary as well about Niger Delta heroes, um, and for that, it's actually been males that I interviewed so far. I've got two females as well, but the, it was the males that presented first. So I try and just go with the flow, you know, naturally. Um, I've been in the film industry now for about 20 years. So, you know, I've taken my time to really just even delve into this thing. So it's a journey and it's, it's nerve wracking. It's, it's a lot, you know, it takes so much to make a movie, guys, like seriously, you can't even imagine. I'm sure, you know, you, you know, and I think we should talk more about that. Those are the challenges that we have. Those are the challenges I'm having, you know, trying to gather a team and gather the set and this and this. It's like ridiculous. All these people have to get paid, you know, everyone is on your neck. Um, so it's, it's, it's real, you know, and I think we as women should talk more about what our ch challenges are so we can get people who can connect with us and help us because it's a journey, you know, so that's how I walk it. And I want to talk about uh, the power of these films when, you know, aside sort of the, um, the potential, just the vision for someone seeing themselves represented, uh, what, well, let me ask it another way, what is the cost of the male gaze? Like, what are we missing by the fact that, you know, cinema right now, film right now is so dominated by perspective led by men? And because something I was speaking to a film, let me put this in context, speaking to a, a film critic friend of mine who says, or he, he believes that films led by women sort of, sort of have more humanity, um, are led by some sort of a more uh, delicate touch, not to use that word, yeah, but, um, yeah, so just trying to understand something I'm curious about, like, if you say there was a difference, like, I don't know if you understand my question, I'm rambling. <laughs> um, so you're talking about the male gaze? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how does that affect us? When I say, I say, what is the cost, what, what the, the cost? fact, yeah, the, what the, the fact that film right now is dominated by, you know, by being led or helmed by men, how to be different, you know? Well, well, rather, when films are helmed by women, how is it different? Well, I think, so in March, there was a black, uh, black women directors uh, 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 workshop or lab um, at the MoMA. And, it was, a, and it, was, it was put together by this amazing collective called the New Negro Society. And uh, the night before, there was a dinner, like a round table dinner, where we all just kind of like sat and we, you know, we were, the, the intention was to build, to talk about what we wanted to build. And we spent most of the time, we couldn't spend 30 minutes straight talking about what we wanted to build because we had all of these experiences like PTSD that we needed to burn off. So the conversation couldn't, couldn't stay for, for like 20 minutes because we would, someone would start and then they'd have to kind of release this experience that happened. And this is, I think it's a combination of being in America, Hollywood, and, and it being an industry run by, uh, by men. And so, and, I, and for me, it was just kind of interesting um, because the cost is that we're, we're spending a lot of energy having to burn off these experiences, having to lift these 
experiences off of us so that we can be in a very free, released place to create the work that we're supposed to create. But a lot of us are so weighed down, um, speaking for the, the women at that room and, and for myself, to a certain extent, weighed down by all of these experiences and things that we see, the things that people have told us, what is possible, what is not possible. And we're just trying to be these free artists. And um, it was really, in another situation, it would have been really angering because at least I was in a room full of women who were actually making films. Had I been in a room full of women who were still trying to figure it out, but they're not able to do it, but at least these women, even though we had all these things, we were making our films. And so it's a little bit upsetting because it's just like, I don't want to talk about men and I don't want to talk about white people anymore. I just got to a point where I was like, I don't, I'm done. I just, I want to be in a room and I want to talk about, okay, what are we doing? What are we building? And so it was very clear for me and I said, you know, let's, let's take this opportunity to burn it off. Let's burn it off now, get it done so that the next time we meet, we don't have to talk about this again. And again, not to say that um, we shouldn't create safe spaces to have those conversations, but it would be nice to really just try to push ourselves in general to really talk about, focus on what we want to build. That to me is, that's why I don't, I can't really, I don't care about the male gaze. I don't care about white people. I don't care about how they think of me, how they see me. And so, um, but I, but there is importance in, we got to talk about it and burn it off. And so just finding the balance of burning it off, but getting, getting back to work so that we can be the free people that we are, free artists that we are. Thank you for that. <laughs> and I guess I don't know to uh, flip with asking that question. I want to speak to each of you, like your experiences, for instance, working with, working with uh, D. Reese, uh, with you working with female scriptwriters, and with you working with Jadi Osibiru. And sort of what stood out to you in each of those exper in your experiences when you were working with you know, a, a female um, director? We will start with you. Yeah, I think, um I really enjoy working with directors, male or female. I love that interaction. Um, but I think for females, like with Jade in Isoken, she was very particular about Isoken's look. She had a very clear idea, like to the nails, like she was so super anal about it. And I loved that because that's how you create characters. You know, um, it challenged me as an actor as well to shed, really, it helped me to shed myself so I could be this character. Um, so I really loved that about her. Tokwe Oshin as well as another director I've worked with, and she's great. Um, known her for years, and um, she's very subtle and strong. You know, she doesn't want you to flail about too much. She wants it to be very contained. So, and I like to free myself so that it, because as an actor, if you think too much about how you're being directed, it can affect how you even perform. So you just have to trust the director and say, you know, but with females, I notice there's subtlety, there's strength, you know, um, and it's, it's beautiful, actually, I think. I've really enjoyed working with uh, female directors, and I look forward to it more. For me, this there's not much of collaborating with females because I don't know why, but I've noticed that being an independent filmmaker, a lot of people on my set are male because if I'm the director, the DP is a male, the sound person is a male, the costume, everybody seems to just, there isn't one female that I've, I think, it's a, apart from producing, I haven't met other filmmakers that are not in costume or makeup. And I think that has to change because a lot of the time people, these jobs are seen as, because it's carrying heavy duty stuff, it should be a man. Um, but the, in terms of maybe complications that I have on set is me being sometimes the only female on set, is there's a thing where, I don't know if it's because I'm young as well, there's a thing where it's I've seen as a bit intimidating. So I come on set and I say this is how I want things done and I want, I'm very particular about how scenes look and how many takes we do. So. There's that thing where sometimes people see, it, see me as a bit intimidating, and I feel a bit intimidated as well, because I'm looking at people that are way older, these people that have been working in the industry for ages, and I'm coming in, and I'm 25, and they're like in their 30s and 40s, and I'm like, pick it up and do this. And they're looking at me like, what? <laughs> but then I guess- and you're like, pick it up and do it. <laughs> 
exactly. In, in the end, you do have to be firm and say that because in the industry, you don't have to look at age. You can't look at age. You're here to deliver something amazing. And if you're there looking at me because I'm young, then how exactly are we going to create like great content? Um, but then I look at people like Mo Abudu, Biola Labi, Mary and Joko, and they're all females ruling the industry in, the, in Nigeria. And I'm thinking if they're doing it, then I can, I can do it as well. So, yeah. Um, to stay on that, Elizabeth, before we get to your deeper, do you find that, because I was reading an article recently where the director of Rafiki, I believe, she said she was choosing this film about, um, uh, about love between same-sex characters, and she found that she, same-sex female characters, she found that she had to, she was working with a crew that was misogynistic. Um, do you find that you had to sort of convince almost or sort of have your crew like carry them along in the story like for instance when you're shooting Tolu for instance would you get how does that work when um, ideologically your crew they're not necessarily on the same page as you or don't believe in the same things that you do for instance so you mean with a film like gender equality or yes yeah okay if um, you ever had to deal with that or anyone a lot of the time I found that I think there's nobody as passionate as I am when I'm working on a film. Maybe because I wrote it, I'm investing financially in it, and I'm directing it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time, there's, before I start any shoot, I have to bring everybody on board, like you said, speak about what we're actually creating. Not that we're just here to shoot and go, but do you actually understand why we're making this film and what the story is and what, I guess, we're trying to connect with the audience. So sometimes it's challenging because this industry, I've noticed from the three, four years I've been working, is that people see it as a money-making business. There are very few that find it, uh, there are very few that are here for the passion to tell stories. Mm -hmm. A lot of pe people are here to do their job and leave, get paid. So it is a bit challenging to get people that are all in the same room and are all for the passion and not just the money. So that's something I guess I'm still struggling with. Mm -hmm. I'm going back to your deeper about working with D. Reese. That yeah. what, what I experience um, was like. Yeah, real quickly, I wanted to respond. I think, I think the, the approach is, like you said, is to be really clear about, as long as you're clear, then you're able to disseminate that clarity to anybody who's going to be involved in the project. I think for me as a director, um, it was the same thing. It was like, I'm able, as long as I'm clear, I'm able to say, you know, let's, you know, kind of do weird things that people aren't used to on, on, on To Be Free was directed, written by women, myself, and then produced by two women as well. And, you know, we did things where, you know, I, we did a circle in the beginning of the day and, you know, I talked about, like, why I did this film. And um, I think I even called my mom from Nigeria just for them to, you know, just to say hi and kind of, like, bless the space. Like, I do corny things, like, you know, weird woo-woo things like that. But I feel like it just, like, like we, are in, we, are, we are the ones to set the tone. And those who follow along, follow along. And, you know, it's kind of like even there's not even a room for people who are kind of like bringing their crazy ornery energy to it. Because it's like, listen, I already told you what it was. This is what it is. Don't bring your bad vibes. <laughs> Don't bring your bad vibes. Or just, just, or just be respectful of the story that we're telling. You know, for me, what To Be Free was a really about like, what does it mean to be free in a black body and that exploration? And you know, if anyone who's uncomfortable with that, it's like just I'm just letting you know now. That's what we're steeped in. That's what this is all about. Um, but going back to working with D. Reese, um, it was amazing. She's amazing. Um, I think she was the first Black woman director that I worked with. Um, and since then, I've worked with like Ava DuVernay and uh, a Nigerian director um, K. O. Yegu in New in L. A. But uh, yeah, in terms of, she was really passionate about the story. She is, in my opinion, an actor's director, um, and that's not necessarily always the case with the director. There are some directors who are very technical, and you know they can make amazing pictures, but there are those directors who really love actors, really want to find out how to talk to actors, and give people exercises and homework assignments that really help steep the characters in, um, you know, in the in the in the in the story. And D was that director, and so um, and just like she was just open, very open to uh, questions that I had. Made herself available, um, recommended books for me to read, and I love all that stuff. And so yeah, it was very like um, 
I don't know, like a familiarity. Um, so even though we weren't friends, I mean, we were, you know, we've become friends, but at the time it just, she made herself open and it just kind of steeped everything in a very grounded place. Um, yeah, she's wonderful. Mm, and piggybacking off that experience, in your, and everyone can answer this, what for you are sort of examples where um, that has come through, where a woman, um, a film that's held by a woman, um, was told and realized in a way that you felt was, um, that you were sort of satisfied by the story, you satisfied by how it was. So for someone who doesn't have an example for what power it could have when um, a story is held by a woman, like what are your, oh, no, I'm rambling again, um, what are your, <laughs> <laughs> what would you say is an example of a, of a story, to use that, to borrow that term, the feminine gaze that was, that was realized or told well by a woman? If we could start. I didn't hear the question. Um, sorry. Really I talk fast, sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, what is an example where a story that was told by a woman in a very satisfactory, very accomplished way, that you felt like this was, you felt represented, you felt that like this was well told, you felt like this was true to you, to your experience? Something that you've seen, yes. Oh, wow. Oh. Yeah, jump in? yeah um, I recently just saw King of Boys by Kemi Adetiba. Um, I'd watched it here and there, but I needed to sit down and just watch it. I wasn't feeling well, so yeah, that was like perfect. Uh, Netflix, chill. And um, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the fact that she went there. You know, she and there were some scenes that were just so beautiful and well put together, the thought process. I was really amazed. I was like, wow, you know, we're actually pushing, we're actually pushing in Nigeria right now in terms of the themes that are coming out of our movies. So I was really impressed by um, the fact that, and I know how difficult it is to be on a set and be the woman and be, because I've worked with her but on a commercial, so that's a little bit different. Also very tough, because commercial, you have to over and over and over. But I enjoyed it, I enjoyed her energy. So I just imagined having that energy on the set, you know, um, and I was very happy and I was very proud, you know, like, yeah, we're really taking the bull by the horns, you know, um, as females. And, you know, being female didn't hold it back, you know, because that tends to be the case, you know. Um, like even for me as an actor, I'm married and sometimes I have to be in a movie where I'm kissing a guy and I have to deal with the press saying, oh, look at what she's doing. But that's my job, you know, like, so that's another issue, you know, as females in the industry and representation, it even can clash with the work if you let it though, you know, and I don't let it. Yeah, I've always been a bit nutty. Um, <laughs> the, First film about you know by being bisexual, for instance, emotional crack. I don't know if you remember it. 2003. At that time, you know, this was 2002. Man, people were like, "Who is this girl? She cray cray," you know. Um, and all I did was I told my mom, I was like, "Mom, I'm gonna do something, and people are gonna talk about it, but this is this this is it." She was like, "Do you feel really passionately about it?" I said, yes, mom. She's like, oh, okay, go for it then, you know. Um, and I'm really honored to have that kind of female in my own life because that's also, that gives me permission to say, hey, you can just be all you want to be and do what you have to do for your art. And I think it's important. It's very rare in Nigeria because most parents would, you know, be like, eh, hey, do you know what they would say about me in church? Ah, please. Oh, you know what I mean? Like, we have that to deal with that. So... To, to be able to have that, it really it helped me be free in my work um, and to say, hey, it's, it's part of the job if I have to kiss somebody, if it's part of a job if I have to kill somebody and look so scary that when you see me in person, you'll be like, yeah, I'm scared to go to her, she's mad, you know. Um, that's the response you want to get. That's what you want, you know. So, um, yeah, I think that's kind of how, how I see it anyway with, with that. I think the first one that came to me that I saw, was it this year, earlier this year, was um, Capernaum by um, Nadine Labaki. I don't know if anyone has seen this film, but it is extraordinary, relentless in, in this, the truth that she was giving. It felt like I was watching real life. It felt like I was watching a documentary on the inside. And, I, and the whole time I was watching it, 
I was puzzled about how was she getting certain shots? How was she getting these performances from these actors um, and these kids? Um, it's such a beautiful film and just, um, uh, it really, really marked me and it stayed with me. And it was one of those films where if I, I, if I could have left, I would have walked out and left because it was just, just how inside of a story it was. And hearing her talk about the film, you know, I, I think it was, there was a Q and A in New York and I asked her, you know, were there, was, there, was there any point in time where you felt like, you know, you shouldn't do this, you didn't have the right to tell the story, it was too much. And she just unflinchingly said no. She said this is a story that needed to be told. And um, it was really, 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 I was inspired by all the facets of that filmmaking. So if you haven't seen that film, I highly recommend it. Capernaum, yeah. Meeting? Um, in terms of the power of film, I think I never really understood how much of a power in terms of starting a conversation a film can have until I experienced it for something that I did myself. So this year I uh, did a short film called I Am Not Corrupt and I never thought it would raise so many conversations as it did. So the, it, was, it was for a foundation. We were to make a film that was, would talk about corruption and I was thinking of a creative way to tell the story that would attract people to actually want to listen to something that people just say, oh, it's corruption, it's never going to change. But I was thinking of which way can I drag people in to actually sit down and watch something and speak about it. And for me, that was amazing because I put two people in a room and it was very simple, the setup, but then it was engaging in a way, in the way that we shot it, but also in the dialogue. So um, in terms of the power that has in order to change people's minds, get people talking about things that they don't think they have any business talking about, for me, that was really good. And I'm going to move like slightly now to talk about Roots really quickly. I don't know if we have enough time. Um, to start with you, Adipura. So um, I imagine you're Nigerian-American, yeah. right? Um, and does that ever come into play in kind of roles that you're offered, kind of roles, kind of opportunity that you can get? Because um, I don't know if anyone sort of followed the story when uh, Cynthia River was cast as Harriet Tubman. It was the whole thing about African Americans, yeah. uh, British people can't take our roles because you didn't go through slavery and s such and such. Um, yeah, how does that, how do you navigate that? Or if you have, even have to deal with that at all? How do I navigate those experiences for myself? Mm. Or do you have to like, do you have to like answer, the, does it come into play, the fact that you're Nigerian American, does, does that ever factor into anything at all? Um, that's a good question. Again, I don't really, unless somebody says something to my face, I don't really spend much time considering. I mean, I know the conversations that are being had around the nonsense conversation, I will say, about black British taking, I mean, I, I have a lot of things to say about that, but I do think it's nonsense, because it's just another way to just, to just distract and put us in boxes. It's just really so silly and a waste of our time. But um, I think in the beginning, you know, there was, uh, you know, people maybe suggested that I, you know, change my name, make it easier, blah, 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 which that wasn't an option. And it was interesting that, you know, now maybe people might see, oh, that I have an advantage just because, eh, which I don't agree with, and I think it's silly, like, oh, it's a bit of a, an exotic thing, like, oh, you have a, you know, you have like an exotic name, you know? Um, so that might make me favorable in the eyes of those who are casting. I don't, I don't know, I, I, really couldn't, I really couldn't tell you, um, but I, I've had, I haven't had anyone say that I don't have any business, I mean, not to my face, that I don't have any business um, you know, being a part of something. But I do remember with 12 Years a Slave when people were saying, you know, this is the year of the African, how does it feel? And it was just so silly, because we've been here, like we, you know, Chiwetel has, has been around, like the people have been here acting. It's not like Africans just came out of nowhere and just like, hey, we're here, we're like, you know, taking things over. And it was just an interesting perspective and I never really thought about that. But, um, so again, it's a perspective that I, you know, I'm not privy to and I just, you know, I kind of just mind my business and, you know, I'm, you know, I'm 
black is black is black. And so I'm for whatever is black, whether you're from Nigeria, America, Brazil, whatever it is. So that's kind of where I'm focused on. Yeah. And uh, I'll throw that to you, Dakari, as well, because you mentioned that uh, in your last answer about being, you know, married. Because I remember, um, I think it was the early 2000s when you just got married, and I think it was one of those, you know, gossip rag magazines were like, oh, you know, you can't take these roles anymore, blah, blah, blah. And, but I want to understand sort of how you came to that. Was that just instinctive, like, oh, I'm going to do this anyway? Or that sort of played some role in the kind of, like, the kind of jobs you could take, kind of characters you could play? Yeah, um, you see, and that's another issue about women and how in society we're expected to be a certain way. If you're married, you're limited in what people expect from you, which is BS, because I still have my own purpose, you know, regardless of whether I'm married or whatever. So I was quite shocked by that. Um, for me, I, I don't sit back and think, hey, this is how I'm going to plot this, I'm going to do this. Well, maybe a little bit, but not so much. You know what I mean? Like, um, <laughs> it just happened that when I got married, I was at a point where I was frustrated with Nollywood in terms of how they were treating artists. Um, we weren't p getting paid very well. And um, you would, for instance, be reading a script and you get to set and they've added maybe another script to it. And you're like, why? <gasps> she asked why? Hey, who are you? Da, da, da. Uh, your father, da, da. Bass, boss, everyone's talking. <laughs> I became that mad girl, you know, and I'm just asking, and the reason why was because they wanted to stretch the film from part one to part four. For, you know, so when you were talking about people who are in the industry just to make money, that's kind of the reality of what we were dealing with at that time. And at that time, that was about 2005, 2006. I was like, man. So that was happening on the one hand. And then I got married and, and I wanted to focus. I just wanted to focus on raising my family, you know, it was very important to me. And it happened that way. So for four and a half years, and also my husband had an issue with the romantic roles. Yes, I said it. Um, <laughs> so, and I thought, okay, you know what? Let me, let's compromise, let's see how this goes, you know? And I would get offered roles and I wouldn't be able to do it because of the romantic roles, so I wouldn't do it. And I didn't do this the next one, and I didn't do this next one. And I was kind of like, I don't know about this arrangement, okay? <laughs> how far? So my husband and I had to sit down. I was like, you know what? This is not working. I'm not growing as an artist. I really need, I really want to do this. This is my life. You know, you met me this way. So why are we having this conversation? Da, da, da. And we did that dance for a while. And then I gradually started getting back into work. I went back to acting school in Chicago. Um, you know, just took my time. You know, worked on my weight because it was very, also very challenging as a new mother, you know. Um, my body changed and I was like, who is this person? <laughs> so I had to work on that, you know, so it was a real process, you know, um, and navigating the industry even now, you know, you're coming up against these young girls, man, and they be like, you know, we want to do this. <laughs> and you're like, oh my dear, no vex, you know. Um, so it's a very, it's become very competitive and, you know, having to work with new media, social media, dealing with that and so it's, it's a thing, but I love it. I enjoy it. This is who I am. This is what I am, um, you know, and I'm comfortable with that and I've been very fortunate as well. I had to work really hard though because I had to start all over again, you know, can you imagine you're leaving the game like, you know, doing relatively well, you know, winning awards and stuff and doing all this stuff and then you disappear and then you come back and the game has changed and you have to now re-strategize and re, you know, the whole thing. Um, and then I did 50 and then like, ugh, boom. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That was actually my seventh film back in. So it, it wasn't easy. I didn't come back to an industry that was just like, oh, the car is back. They missed me, but they were like, oh, is she serious? Does she really need the money? She's married to a rich man's son. She doesn't need money. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you 
You know what I mean? So this is the reality. I'm really letting you guys into what it is, what the struggle is, you know, between what you love to do and what society expects from you. So everything we do is a statement, you know, it's a, it's a big F you, like, ah, I'm here and I'm gonna do what I have to do, you know, so it's, it's a real um, beautiful challenge and a struggle, but I love it, you know, I live for it. And even being able to be in LA, you know, for some time, you know, because I moved over there when I had my status changed, so I had to um, um, go there and live there for a while. And we loved LA, so I tried to do that whole thing. I went on auditions, I got in some rooms, you know, I did some things, but nothing was happening, and this was the reality. Um, and it's different, because over there, they don't know you. Who are you? Oh, you're big in Hollywood? No, what's Nollywood? You know, like, you know, there's that, there's still that, you know, there's still that thing going on, but it's changing, and so I, I decided to flip it instead of going over there and trying to assert myself. I said, you know what? I'm going to just stay in my base and work that way. You know what I mean? Because it was another different type of mind trip, you know? Um, I enjoyed it still because it was also a journey. You know, it was like, okay, no one knows me, so I can push myself. I don't have to deal with all of that other stuff. It taught me what it takes to work in Hollywood, and kudos to you, man. Like, seriously, sister, much respect, because it's not a joke. No, I'm serious, it's not a joke, you know? Um, I, but I find that it's a little easier when you've been a pr product of that system, like you've gone to school there, you lived there as a kid, or you spent a major part of your life there, I find that it's a little easier because you've already assimilated into that culture. When you're coming from a different culture and a different way of doing things, um, especially when you're already established where you're from, it's different, but it's humbling. I really enjoyed that journey too, you know, and I have my little tribe out there. I see my sister, Una. Um, you know, who, you know, I met over there as well, you know, so it's good to be able to be in those worlds, you know, just, but don't forget your roots. We're at a time where the world is looking for diversity, is looking for something fresh, something different. So just be doing your own thing in your little corner, you know, and do it with excellence and you'll continue to push yourself that way, you know, so it's been a, it's, it's a journey, man, for real. <laughs> it's a journey. To move sideways a little bit to you, Nadine. Um, do you feel, I remember um, I was at a Kadna Kaba Fest, uh, the Boots Festival, where someone, one of the panelists has said she doesn't feel a, res a responsibility to explain um, issues to do with the North just because she's a Northerner, right? That's something, is that the concern that you have or you sort of preoccupy yourself with? Like, like when, you, when you did uh, Through Our Eyes, it was about a female, uh, a chi female girl child uh, bomber. Um, do you feel a duty to represent those stories, to tell those stories, just because of where you're from? I get a lot of people saying, because I'm from the North, I should be telling Northern stories. Um, but I don't think it's like that. If I'm a creative, why do I have to, again, box myself into the kind of filmmaker I am? I'm not going to be a Kanye Wood filmmaker or a Nollywood filmmaker. I'm a creative in general. Wherever I find the story I want to tell, I'll tell it the way I want to tell it. So we, through her eyes, it was in the north. With Tolu, it was half Pidgin, half Yoruba. I don't even speak Yoruba, but I decided to take the plunge and do that. Um, so really, it's basically where I am and where the story takes me. Mm -hmm. And with that, we'll open up to questions, if anyone has hands up, if you have a question. All right, we'll start with my dear friend Jola. Hi, my name is Jola. So I wanted to ask about the aspect of, I've been having a conversation with a few of my friends who are in the creative industry. And we were talking about the concept of stooping to conquer for female creatives who have decided to not just be in the creative space, but also create, which involves financing. So I know we're in a very feminist age and we're trying to assert ourselves. But um, as someone who's had to raise money and funding, um, there's a lot of, there's a struggle with being strategic and being yourself and being authentic and not wanting to feel the feminist movement. And you need, but you need money and you need people to respect you or see you in a certain light. And I wonder how you deal with the tension of being in rooms where sometimes it's clear 
they don't necessarily respect you. Sometimes they are humoring you, like, oh, okay, it's one of these girls that wants to do this thing, fine. And, um, but you need, you need the money. You need um, the access. You need um, the financing. You need, you need what they have. Um, and how do you figure out when to be like, okay, this is humiliating, this, can, this is rude, this is upsetting. Um, when do you, how do you figure out when to be like, okay, I'm going to sit here and take this. And when do you decide like, okay, no, I can't, I'm not going to put myself through this because I, I'm, I have an end goal. And even though it's going to jeopardize the end goal, I'm going to stand my ground on a certain issue. I'm not going so far as to say like sexual or physical harassment, but there are places where you are disrespected and you know it's fully based on your gender or your age. When do you say, okay, the goal is more important and when do you figure that, no, I'm just not going to take this? I think it's, I think it's about being clear about what you're doing and why you're doing what you're doing. You know, sometimes the money that someone offers you it's coming to you in a very disrespectful manner. If you take it, are they gonna allow you to do your vision the way that you want it, or are you gonna have to make concessions? If you're making those concessions, are you gonna be able to live, are you gonna be able to wake up and be okay with yourself and the choices that you made? And if that's not the case, then it's not, it's all about you want the collaborators, whether they're giving you money or they're producing, you want it to be in alignment with who you are and what you're trying to do. And I'm a firm believer that I will leave effed up money on the ground if that means I have to wait a few, I don't know, wait to get, to get the money or to get the right people in the way that I feel like is, um, is going to kind of help my vision. So I think it's something that you have to, you know, because some people do make choices where, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with this, whatever's going on. Um, because I know that it's gonna help me make the thing or help me get into a door. It's a choice that, it's an individual choice. And I think you just have to know yourself enough to know, if I make this choice, am I gonna be okay? And if you know that you're not gonna be okay and you do it anyway, or if you know you're not gonna be okay and it takes time, then it's okay because, you know, but I think a lot of people they kind of waver because they're not clear. Um, but as long as you're clear, I think that and trusting yourself, trusting your gut, what is your, what is your spirit telling you? If it's saying no, then trusting that if I say no here, that the yes is gonna come, that the right collaborators, that the money that, the money that I need is going to come. A lot of people make those choices because they don't believe that the money is going to come. So they feel like they're, they're, they're stuck. And I do believe as a creative person, as a human being, we are, in this day and age, we're never ever stuck. We're never, we're never, we don't have to go in a way that doesn't feel right. So, um, and I don't think you ever should be in a position or have to deal with a position creatively, particularly where you're being disrespected for whatever reason. Um, I don't know, that's just my personal opinion. Um, I think, sorry, for me, I think it's knowledge is power, right? So if you're going to go look for funding somewhere, do your research, know who you're going to, know why you're going, and know if the film or the idea you're coming up with matches with what they want. Because if you're going into a room, for instance, where they're focused on gender equality, but then you want to make a film about something else, they're not really going to look at you or take you seriously. Because one, you haven't done your research to know what it is that you're actually going to look for. But then also you've, put, you've wasted your time and energy going to do that when you, can, you could have found um, other outlets. So I'd just say do a lot more research. And there are avenues and outlets to look for funding. You just need to find them and yeah, do your research. Uh, yeah, question. Hi, my name is Khadija. I recently watched the movie Up North, Up North. And Adiswa's character, I was really fascinated by, and she played a typical Hausa woman. So my question is, how do you do justice to characters that are very foreign to you? Nadine kind of touched on that, but can everybody please explain she on that? I think I'll, I'll take that. Um, well, I, pl I played a mo in a movie where I had to speak French, and girlfriend don't speak French, okay? <laughs> I did French in primary school, and I think from JS1 to 3, and that's where I stopped. So it's not like I didn't know any French, but I worked with a coach on the set. And I'm, you know, quite, if I work with a coach, it's, it's easier that way. And because I knew the intonations, I, I, so it was a marriage of 
those both styles, you know, having a coach and then also speaking from my own little French that I knew, you know, that I learned in school. And I was able to create this character that people actually loved and would, I got feedback from, I actually won Best Actress in some film festival for it. I'm like, what? So, but you have to, you, you shock yourself when you challenge yourself, you know, and, and for an actor, that's like gold. We want to transform, you know? So when you give me the chance, oh my God, I'm gonna go with it with like everything I got. So the combination of that, um, you have to humble yourself, you have to put yourself in one place, like just put yourself out of the equation so that you can create this person and become this person. It's not, it's an alchemy that occurs, but you have to open yourself to that process. Um, work with your director, listen to your director, um, use resources. You might not even be able to have a coach. You can go on YouTube. You, can, you understand, like, we're in an age where information is, we're overloaded with information. So there's really no reason why you shouldn't, you know, rise to that kind of a challenge because there are resources. Ask your friends. You have a friend that speaks Igbo. Oh, how do you say Igbo? Like my mom. Oh, my mom is like my coach too because, like, if I have to speak Yoruba or I have to speak Ijo, I just say, hey, mom, how do I pronounce this? Thing? <laughs> say it again. <laughs> say it again. You know? And I, you just do that. So use what's around you. It's not, it's not that deep, honestly. Especially if you want to do justice to the character, you will do whatever it takes to make that happen. So yeah, I hope I've helped. <laughs> I think we've run out of time. One more question. Oh, one more over there, sorry. Two more. No. <laughs> I am so sorry. It looked like you guys were having a lot of fun, but he'd already told me that the time was up, which means that you guys obviously managed to engage them. And uh, they didn't even know that one hour had gone. So I would like you to join me in saying a huge thank you to Adekpe Rouduye, Nadine Ibrahim, Ayode Jirotinwa, and Dakore. Thank you so very much. If you can stand up for your group photograph, I just have a few.